You're on, Todd, I think. Am I? If we're live, I'll go. <laughs> Didn't get a countdown there. All right. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us this afternoon as we continue OC Forum's The Future Of program series with a look at the future of the economy. My name is Todd Harmonson, and I'm the senior editor of the Orange County Register. These are crazy times that we're living through right now. Um, we're all adjusting. Hopefully, you're all in your casual Friday sweats or um, pajamas, and we can enjoy some time together talking about the economy. It's not necessarily the greatest thing to talk about right now. In the past six weeks alone, we've had 30 million people go on um, file unemployment claims. It gets a little scary, but we've got some people here who can talk to you about what they know and what they're expecting out of the economy. Uh, first, we're going to be hearing from Dr. Robert Eiler, uh, the president of economic forensics and analytics and professor of the economics at Sonoma State University in Northern California. And he'll be followed by Joel Kotkin, a presidential fellow in urban feature futures at Chapman University in Orange, California. At the conclusion of the program, we'll be opening it up to Q&A from the audience. If you have any questions, please enter them in the comments and we'll do our best to get as many um, through as many of them as we can. So let's get started with Robert, um, Dr. Robert Eiler, who's going to be joining us via audio. So, Dr. Eiler, are you there? I am. Great. Well, welcome, and thank you for joining us. So we're hearing many economic comparisons being made to where we are now and the 1918 pandemic and the Great Depression. Can you provide us some context about that? Yeah, I mean, you're going to see some unemployment figures that are going to be reminiscent of the Great Depression in terms of having it be very high very quickly. But one thing to remember is the Great Depression, it took some time for the unemployment rate to get that high. And it took successive events to get to that point that are more reminiscent of sort of the, the sum of parts in the Great Recession. And that's why we've labeled the Great Recession the Great Recession because there were parts of it that were more reminiscent of the Great Depression than this episode should be, but for the labor market data and the GDP contraction data. So once we're through this episode, two things to keep in mind is one, that we expect there to be a lot of the policies that we put in place coming to fruit over the next few quarters once we open our economy back up. And second is that the financial side of the house coming into this situation on the labor market and the income market side uh, was not as not as broken apart as both the time going into the Great Depression and also the Great Recession. So some of those comparisons are easy to make from the way we're going to see the numbers move around, but the time in which it took the numbers to get there, and hopefully the time in which it brings those numbers back down to earth, is going to be much more compressed in time than, let's say, either the Great Depression and probably the Great Recession, but for a more ugly episode in the current frame. Okay. Well, now that we have some historical context, where are we now in terms of the national and state economies? Well, we're kind of in the dark time right now. So one of the things you're going to see over the next couple of months are some data that suggests that we're going to have a severe contraction in our economy. If you think about the way that Chinese data started to roll out a couple of months ago, we're probably going to have very similar contraction in GDP data, at least in, in, uh, in context to what we've done with our economy and sort of going into hibernation. Uh, the state economy is following that, and, and California, to a certain extent, may actually lag a little bit the U.S. in terms of the rollout piece and coming bringing our economy back to life. But we're, now we're in this sort of debate stage. So the way I've been characterizing it is it's basically a tale of three policies. We have a negative social policy that's still very restrictive, but slowly loosening up. We have waiting in the wings monetary and fiscal policies that are looking very reminiscent to the sum of parts at the end of the Great Recession, which are meant to provide the boost to our economy to come out of this sort of darkness and back into the light, if you will. And as we start to climb back up, we should see the fruit of those two policies coming together in what an economist would call policy accommodation. So if you're putting those two positives together, they should start to feed off of each other to a certain extent and help propel our economy forward. The problem is that business confidence, consumer confidence have to walk hand in hand for those policies to actually bear fruit. And if they don't, then the affectation of those policies may be relatively slow. So we're right now at the stage where we're waiting for the economy to come out of hibernation and actuate the policies we put in place. Okay. Um, so you've been privy to discussions on the economy within the governor's office. What can you share us about? Share with us about what you're hearing. Well, the governor's office is actually relatively pessimistic about where we're going, and that's because they are in somewhat command of the social policy and their their foresight on the social policies they're going to learn and remain relatively restrictive on the short end 
with the idea that the rollout is going to probably probably relatively slow, which might make more pain in our economy. Uh, so they're being relatively pessimistic on the front end. And then the, on the back end, they look like they're actually going to be a little bit more optimistic as we come out of the next couple of years. But uh, for right now, the governor's office in, in California is kind of in this weird middle ground where they kind of control the keys of the car. And if they're not willing to turn the car back on, we're just going to kind of sit in idle. Uh, but once they do, then the supposition is the federal policies start to kick in. The original economic engine that was in California will sort of take hold of that and really start to run. And the governor's office on the pessimistic side uh, is maybe a little bit more pessimistic than a lot of economic forecasters who tend to see that we would come back sometime in late 2021, maybe early 2022 to the original baseline. The governor's office is thinking more like 23 or 24. Okay, so we're looking out a few, you know, a couple of years possibly there. A lot of people are wondering about what's coming soon. Um, what do you see happening in the next three to six months? Yeah, there's sort of there's three things I see happening. One is we're going to see the slow reawakening of our economy. That's part one. Part two is we're going to figure out exactly how many jobs are going to be lost in the short run, first burst in net. So there's this all this job loss now, and then there'll be. As the, as the economy reopens, some of those folks will come back to work that lost their jobs, may not be everybody. And if the, some of those parts allow the capacity and the structure of the economy to be relatively intact, there may not be a second wave of layoffs slash lost jobs. And that's really what the policies that are put in place are trying to avoid, is to provide the correct sort of, if you will, air mattress to fall onto as we're falling down so we don't get severely affected to where we can bounce right back up and take off. So we're in the next three to six months, we'll see how well that takeoff is as we kind of reawaken and actuate the economy again. Okay. So then what do you see happening in the next few years after that? In the next few years, we're going to test how um, efficacious, if you will, the policies we put into place are actually going to be. And also we're going to test, we're going to test I'm sorry, the, the resilience and the structure of our economy as we came into this episode. So if we have a lot of business losses, we may have a longer duration of unemployment than we expected, and the hurt might be a little bit longer. So what I expect over the next few years is one of two things. Either one, we're going to have a much longer duration of unemployment than we expected, and this is going to look more like the Great Recession than, let's say, a more V-shaped recovery. Uh, or we're going to have something that's kind of like a modified V-shape where it's not a pure V where we go down in five months, back up in five months like nothing happened, and this is just like – a weird night out where we drink too much and we're now stumbling to the next couple of days and it didn't matter anymore anyway. I think it's going to be more of a so-called modified D where let's say the right leg of the V is going to move out at a little bit more obtuse angle than a true V-shaped recovery. But the key is whether or not we're again able to take hold of these policies, really test the metal, if you will, of our economy and get back toward what we thought we were going to be sometime next year. Furthermore, if we don't get a vaccine or we have a, a reinvigoration of this no. virus as we go into the early part of next year, that will definitely dampen uh, business and consumer confidence in such a way that can elongate the problem. Yeah, I think that's what scares a lot of people is what if we get yeah. a second round of this? Yeah. So there's a lot of grim news about the economy that you read. Uh, some of it you're reading in the register. Um, hopefully mixed in with some of the good news that's out there, but um, we've got to give you everything that's going on. Do you also see some opportunities in what's going on right now? Right now? I do. Uh, for California, I, I, there's two, maybe three opportunities. One is that on the construction side, construction actually may be okay in all this, and it may continue to be a place where we see more growth over the next, let's say, six to 12 months. We've heard a lot of counties start to roll out last week and this week, the ones that did not have construction set up as essential may see some more rollout. And construction is one of those businesses that once you start to get rolling, it has a lot of so-called value add that can lead to a lot of additional economic impacts throughout the state. So if construction sags, that's a bad thing. And the opportunity there is to actually keep construction flowing with relatively low interest rates, maybe relatively decent, not amazing forecasts as we see this thing slowly unfurl going forward toward the end of summer. By 2021, if construction is kind of back on where it should have been otherwise, there's some really good opportunities to deal with housing and continue to, to kind of, you know, see the economy grow forward per where we were before. Manufacturing is another piece. If the federal government foresees that this might repeat, 
and they see California as a place that could be a return of manufacturing in part because we may have a lot of commercial real estate that could be repurposed in a way to uh, provide healthcare, food systems, and other what they might deem essential manufacturing if a crisis comes back or maybe just bringing some manufacturing back toward the United States where California is one of the places that a lot of East Asian goods naturally come in anyway. Uh, there may be some manufacturing opportunities that we have not seen in 20 or 25 years, but the federal government has to take that first step. The calculus on the side of manufacturing, big manufacturing, reestablishing itself in California vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the United States or East Asia is very limited without some federal statement that we want to have it here. But there may be some manufacturing uh, opportunities there. And for consumers, the opportunity is once the veil lifts, and we actually get back to business, there should be some amazing deals all over the place from uh, all kinds of consumer durables to uh, just basically getting your life back to square and also having fuel prices relatively low in the short term for commuting workers. A lot of that may be an opportunity for people to get back on their feet. So I'm seeing some of that. Uh, but for example, the tourism industry is going to continue to sag into the foreseeable future and the cost of doing business in the short term is likely to go up across the board no matter what business you're in. But there are some opportunities as well as some things that we can plan for. And the cool thing is, is on those additional costs, we can be innovative and adapt quickly. California might also find technological opportunities for entrepreneurism inside of that matrix of what do we have to do next in terms of screening, following who's, who's uh, got virus or not, and just and doing some compliance measures at all places where the technology can maybe speed that up and lower the cost for all businesses. So that's where California might fit very well in this nationally and potentially internationally. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, of course. Can you hold on for us a little bit? Because we're going to get some Q&A &A in a bit. Uh, but yep. I'm going to turn now to Joel Kotkin from uh, Chapman University. Joel, hello. Hi. Uh, you gave the OC Forum an outlook for Orange County in January. Things have changed a little bit, but where are we now? Well, I think the, the main thing that I think is happening is that, um, you know, we're basically, uh, we, 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 were in, we were in a bit of a problem, which I'll discuss now, which is fundamentally um, California in general has had an enormous problem with inequality, which I think the pandemic at least initially will make worse. I, you know, um, I think, for instance, some of our, Tech companies, for instance, may do very well. Um, look at us. You know, we're now hooked up on stuff. Zoom is a California company. Um, you know, there's been big increases um, across the board for a lot of the companies like Slack are doing great. Um, on the other hand, um, there are other areas where middle and working class people are going to be hard hit. That's what, what in, in the work that we're doing at, at Chapman on the development of feudalism in California, one of the things is that we have this enormous distortion um, between um, uh, the high-end jobs and low-end jobs. And in Orange County in particular, um, we've really been heading towards low-end jobs. And many of them, uh, and I'm sure Dr. Ella would back me up on this, tourism and uh, hospitality, which has been booming in Orange County in particular, uh, is really going to get hit. And I don't know how long it's going to be um, until we start to see uh, some sort of, of return to the tourism industry, particularly in the case of Orange County, because places like Disneyland and Laguna Beach and Newport are not just American attractions, they're global attractions. Um, so um, uh, are we going to be able to show any of the slides? Um Yes? No? Got a thumbs up, yes. Okay. All right. I just want to just go through a few things about COVID and, and where we fit into this. Um, as we know, California um, has actually survived this pretty well, um, as has Texas. You know, whether how much it has to do with our lockdown policies, I don't know. What I do think is that the three things that really are driving it, I've been working a lot on things in New York. Um, we have... Uh, more people living in homes, therefore they're not going through apartments. We we have um, and we have a great deal of uh, people driving and not taking transit. Transit seems to have been a major contributor uh, to the situation in New York. So New York, New Jersey, uh, Connecticut have a, about um, forty percent of all the fatalities. 
uh, you know, fortunately, we haven't been hit as badly. Um, density is a big problem. It's very complicated. Southern California is a very dense region. It's probably the densest. It's a densest urban region in North America. But our kind of density is still mainly single family home, town home, and we drive and it's dispersed. And that seems to have helped our uh, um, L.A. and Orange counties. Um, one would have expected because so much of the um, of the problem was one of um, of poverty. Well, L.A. and even Orange County has a lot of poverty, but it doesn't seem to have had the same effect. If you take a look um, at transit, I think this is really, uh, you know, it would take a look at the at the differences. Um, I mean, basically, the New York area has about 45 percent of all the transit ridership in the United States. Um, that's one of the reasons, not the only reason, but a reason why um, it had such a big effect. By the way, San Francisco, the city of San Francisco has fairly high transit ridership, but is a much smaller city. Uh, you can you can Uber, Lyft, walk. And also, as my colleague Richard Florida has pointed out, San Francisco is filled with people who can work at home, very sure. high end professionals. The people who are from the area of the country that I'm from originally in North Queens um, or East Brooklyn, uh, they don't have that option. Um, a lot of them are in uh, personal service jobs and they really have no way. And then if you live in Flushing and you want to go uh, and your job is in Manhattan, you really have to take transit. You, there's just no way you're going to drive in. So um, I think that's been a big part of it. Um, I have this map of, of, but maybe I will, we'll try to skip it so we can go a little further. I would just, I want to go into what I think is the problem that we're going to come, that we came in with and now may be worse. And that is Orange County and California in general has become very adept at creating some very high wage jobs, but we are really a low wage, increasingly a low wage economy, particularly Southern California, uh, the Bay Area still produces a pretty good number, but you can see that we're actually producing very few middle income jobs. Um, most of the jobs are being are paying under 40,000 a year, which, you know, in a place like Orange County is not going to get it done. Um, high paid job growth is uh, relative to um, low pay wage job growth. You can see here um, our competitors like Salt Lake, Seattle, uh, even Cleveland, Austin, uh, Baltimore have actually done above the national average. We've been below the national average. And interestingly enough, Silicon Valley is also below the national average. And which one of the unfortunate things about Silicon Valley is it has become more high end, low end and less in the middle. It used to be one of the more egalitarian economies in the country is now one of the least. Um, what is this affecting? One of the things I find really ironic is our state leaders, and now particularly with uh, Tom Steyer heading up our uh, recovery, which is beyond comprehension um, how you come up with that solution. Um, but, you know, they're going to say the solution is more density and more transit. Well, people are going in the exact opposite direction. Um, and we now know that density and transit is negatively um, impact, negatively impact the virus. So because just because you get infected more often uh, in crowded places. And Californians are not moving into the inner city. L.A. lost population. You look at domestic migration. Only the Inland Empire is really growing. Orange County is kind of stagnant. So, you well, know, what's weird yeah. is we, we have state policies that are going in the exact wrong directions. Well, do you see the future of housing in, in California really being affected by what's going on right now? Well, I, th I think we have to really think about uh, about reorienting or our housing policies. A, and I, I actually, I, uh, Frank Pine, um, the publisher at, uh, over at, uh, at 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 the Southern California News Group, was at this meeting we had with Inland Empire leaders. People are moving. The only place where people, particularly young families, are moving in Cal in Southern California, uh, is the Inland Empire. But the policies adopted by the state are making it harder and harder and harder for jobs to come out there. So we need to disperse our jobs and uh, we need a lot more emphasis on single family, could be small lot, single family, 
and also townhomes. One of the things that Dan Young, the former president of uh, Irvine Company, pointed out to me is one of the reasons why we have less infections, let's say, among the Asian American community in Irvine is most of those people own homes and drive everywhere. Where if, if you're in Flushing or Bay Ridge, where the, there's a strong Asian community, they have to take transit and they live in apartments. Um, the, the other thing that I find absolutely astounding, and one thing that could really change the nature of the home market, is transit um, and, and work share. In other words, already in Southern California, more people work at home. This is before COVID than take transit. The state of California, amazingly, despite its insistence on GHG and all that stuff, has no program at all to encourage people to work at home. We're in the midst of an enormous and potentially wonderful transition in terms of, of how people live, what choices they have, they're going to have to make. And the state of California is insisting that trying to duplicate the very things that have made things problematic in New York. It's amazing the um, how the theology of density um, and transit is so deeply uh, rooted, and it's exactly the opposite of what we need to be thinking about. Okay. I want to get to a couple more questions for, um, for you before we turn it over to the audience. Um, your colleague recently held a CEO roundtable. Oh, yes. It's for us from, uh, from that, Matt? Yeah, um, my a colleague, uh, Marshall Toplansky, um, at the business school at Chapman, had a um, meeting with CEOs in Orange County, and he was asking, well, how is the work at home going? Because, you know, let's face it, the boomers and Xers are control freaks, and they don't like people going off on their own, with, with some exceptions, I'm sure. Um, in reality, he said they were shocked how well it was working. Um, and think of the options that we might be able to have for people, let's say young families who want to work for a Newport Beach based company, but can't, but doesn't want to do the hour and a half every day, you know, the torture trip up the 91. So we have an opportunity to make it much easier for Orange County companies to attract workers who don't necessarily have to come in every day. Um, so I, um, I think this is a, a good thing. I think I think it will change. You know, one of the things that uh, I remember a student of mine saying not long ago said, why should I commute in one hour every day to go from one computer screen to another? And, and I, think, I think there's a great opportunity for Orange County because Orange County is a fantastic place to live. If you're at the high end, it's you know, quality of life really is terrific. But not everybody can afford it. The, the bad side of a great quality of life is it's expensive. So can we figure out a way so we can tap a larger population um, uh, and workforce? And at the same time, in like, you know, as Dr. Ella was saying, there's opportunities in manufacturing logistics. That's going to be booming as we go to more online. Is there an opportunity for us in, um, in, um, the, inland, in the Inland Empire particularly to bring a lot of those jobs in. And that will help Orange County because people in the Inland Empire do things in Orange County. They they vacation in Orange County. They go to the Orange County. They, they go to the Angel Games. We have to think of this also in a regional uh, perspective because, you know, my sense is Orange County and the Inland Empire are joined at the hip whether they like it or not. I certainly heard a lot about uh, people from the Inland Empire coming to the Orange County beaches last weekend. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so looking ahead, what can we expect in the next three to six months? I think the thing that worries me the most, and I'm working on this right now, is what's going to happen in our working class and poor communities. Um, a, it hit, particularly in L.A., it hit them a little bit harder, as happened in New York, but not to the same extent. But what are we going to do with those people who work at Disneyland and work at those hotels? What happens to them? They can't work at home. You know, we're, you know, we're kind of the privileged class, the, all of us here. You know, we can, you know, we can get on our computer and work. I don't know. What do we do about these hundreds of thousands of people in the hospitality and uh, industry? How are we going to find things for their young people to do? Um, I worry about that more than any single issue is, is this displaced population that really can't go back to work. You know, those who work in the, on the farms and the factories, 
at, at the at the Amazon and other facilities, they'll I think they'll do all right. They may even grow. I, I don't know, but I think that's that's probably likely. Um, but what about there's no substitute for Disneyland. There just isn't. You can't have virtual Disneyland and 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 have the you know the people working there. So that's my you know Todd. That's what worries me the most. That so. Big picture, where do you see things going in the next few years? Well, I think Orange County is um, is unfortunately tied to the state of California. I think if Orange County was its own state, it probably would come up with some pretty good innovative oh. solutions. We have a lot of very innovative and creative people here in Orange County. But the state of California is is locked into a what I would call neo-feudalist mentality where the only thing that really matters is the very high end and everybody else is on welfare. Um, we have not enjoyed increases in manufacturing even when it was growing elsewhere. Um, I mean, look at the situation that Elon Musk is in right now, where you know they, they shut down the Tesla plant. Um, how long do you think companies are gonna be here? I was talking the other day to a friend of mine in the biomedical industry in Orange County. He says, if California stays locked down all summer, I'm moving everything to Texas and Florida. No, not a good, not a good thing. Probably threatening that, but yeah. yeah. All right. So I appreciate that. And now we've got some questions from the audience, um, and I'd like to get to a couple of those. Um, and Dr. Ireland, are you back on with us? I am. Okay. So this, I'm throwing this out to both of you. Uh, will climate change be considered as a factor influencing the future of the economy? Uh, Jill, I don't know if you want to start, but I can say something if you want. Well, I'll just say very quickly that California's climate policies, which, by the way, have resulted in our being 39th in reductions per capita, uh, so not very successful, very successful in raising the price of energy and raising the price of housing and kicking manufacturers out of the state. As long as you have a a, a um, billionaire like Steyer running our, our state recovery, Climate is going to be more important to them than than getting uh, working class people back uh, back in the labor force. There are many in the green industry, um, if you want to put it that way, who think this is wonderful. They think the pandemic is a is a test run for a shrunken economy, which they think will save the planet. You're talking about celebration of all the clean air because of nobody on the roads and things like that. Yeah. Well, the only thing I would add to that is that, you know, it could be that we do see some ad additional uh, pressure on converting more to solar and renewable energy. Uh, we will see. But other than that, historically speaking, when you come out of tough economic times, policies tend to be more about economic growth than leave the climate in the backseat, at least unless they can somehow nice the two together through entrepreneurism and really almost create an energy market that then feeds the things that otherwise policy wants to see. But Joel's correct is that, you know, you shouldn't expect that to be really a lift of the, of the lower, let's say more uh, lower low to middle class workers who may be most at risk in this situation with respect to their jobs. Great. All right. Uh, next question. When do you see mortgage rates coming down? I think that's more you, Dr. Ella. Well, the, on, the, on the mortgage side, I mean, we are at basically lows right now historically, mm -hmm. so I don't see them going much lower than this, just given the risk characteristics in housing markets. Banks are going to be very reticent to lend any lower than absolutely necessary, but the more we drive 10-year treasury bond rates down, the more on the demand side, we as potential borrowers are going to say, hey, look, you know, if I'm going to borrow this money, uh, you got to be kidding me if you're holding this the rate given the 10-year treasury is like this. So we're getting, I feel like we're kind of at the floor piece. I think the, the bigger question ultimately is when are rates going to go back up and if they're going to go back up, uh, because that'll be something that if the Federal Reserve suddenly says, well, now we got to kick rates up, what kind of signal is that going to send in terms of recovery? They notice they took seven years to make a move out of the Great Recession anywhere off the so-called zero lower bound. So we might be at relatively low rates for some time to come. Yeah, we've been hearing a lot about low rates being out there, but not a lot of loans being written um, because of what's going on right now. So maybe there's that pause also. Yeah, and, and what an economist would call that is they call it credit rationing. So while the markets may not provide rate signals 
for banks to lend less. The bank may say, I don't want to take any more risk than and the, the rate right now is not compensating me for potential risk, so I'm going to lend less, i.e. I'm going to ration the credit. It's sort of a classic lending market reaction to relatively low rates vis-a-vis -vis mm. what they might perceive as the risk. Okay. All right. And then for both of you um, from the audience, would you say uh, Orange County has a similar trajectory to Silicon Valley? Uh, I, I would just say I wish – in some ways I wish it did, but I don't think it does. We – uh, my colleague, uh, Marshall Toplansky, has done a lot of work on Orange County. I mean, we certainly have a a vibrant uh, medical uh, sector, Ted, but, you know, we have not had anything like the growth in technology that Silicon Valley has had. I mean, it's not even close. Um, we still don't have the venture capital. Um, and that's one of the big problems is I think there are going to be great companies that could come out of this pandemic. Um, but until we can fund them here, it's going to be difficult. The biomedical is probably the best the best place to look, if anything, on the tech side. But uh, Silicon Valley is still going to have some relatively monopolistic aspects to it in terms of being a place where those kind of new businesses are going to spin out. To Joel's point, the venture cap is there. The educated labor force just spins out of the universities there. Uh, it's also a, a lifestyle play. And the cool thing for Orange County is that at least that possibility exists because it has a lot of similar characteristics mm -hmm. in some ways. But but just from a structural standpoint, uh, you know, and there were predictions not that long ago that the Silicon Valley was going to move sort of all the way over the Pacific Ocean and end up in Shanghai as the new place. And then you find that the calculus of actually making that move is massive and the cost of remaining in place, while it might look big, on the margins actually relatively small to get a business started and going. So that's, as long as Silicon Valley still has those characteristics, it's going to be really tough for another place to butt up and kind of be rivaling, uh, rivaling Silicon Valley in the way it's structured. Also, I, if I could add just one thing, Todd, also, which is if a Silicon Valley business is going to move, they're probably going to look for a place that's less regulated, has lower housing costs. I mean, that's why Austin is becoming sort of, you know, you know, Silicon Valley part de, and um, and the same thing is happening to some extent in Raleigh as well, Nashville. I mean, one of the biggest issues we raise in our feudalism study is, is there any way that we can get Silicon Valley companies to expand into places like Orange County, like the Inland Empire, parts of the San Joaquin Valley? Right now, they seem to be just jumping over the state line and going everywhere else. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the thing is about those about a lot of the leadership there is they tend to be relatively progressively thinking until the, the P and L's and the balance sheets start coming out and then it's basically mm -hmm. all cash calculus. Yep. So it's it's been it's kind of funny how you've seen that evolution over time where it's not the stuffed shirt classic CEO style, it's a guy on stage with a hoodie who's worth seven billion bucks. <laughs> but at the end of the day, they're gonna choose uh, St. Louis before they choose Southern California because of everything Joel said. It, it's just unfortunately a cash game at the end of the day. Yep. Makes sense. Um, okay. Try to zip through a couple more questions before our time runs out. Uh, if low density is the solution, is there data to suggest how long we can sustainably build new suburbs, exurbs before running out of room and developing uh, greenfield lands? Well, okay. Well, first of all, we're working on that too. Um, and uh, first of all, California is hardly built out. I mean, the, the, as, as you know, the Inland Empire's got enormous amounts of land. We have a lot of unutilized land. One of the big, uh, I think, big opportunities is going to be from retail. And, you know, you, you've got all this overbuilt. We, we were overbuilt retail before. I mean, even before the, the online re revolution came in, there's going to be all sorts of shopping centers. You know, you drive along, let's say, Tustin, and you see one strip mall after the other, which is half empty or, you know, with, with very cheap stores in it. We could build townhomes in those places. That not, I'm not suggesting large lot, big, big house necessarily, but I think you could, you could build townhomes, small lot houses. Um, and, uh, this, uh, and one of the things I find interesting is they'll say, Oh, we have to build all this high density because our pop to meet population growth. Wake up, look at the census. We're not growing population. Our population growth in Southern California is very low, except for the Inland Empire. So, 
Um, I think there's plenty of room uh, that we could grow in. We can grow smart, uh, smartly. I also think that we can show that in many ways the environment would be better off if people had shorter commutes and could live closer to home. And of course, if more people could work at home. Um, th these are options that the state just refuses to look at, you know, and, and so you end up with a situation where in, in, in many ways, very, very many people um, are being forced to make huge commutes uh, so that they could live a decent life. I mean, the problem is that m much of our cognitive elite just doesn't believe that people want to have homes and want to raise families. I guess they think they're all going to end up being in studio apartments and talking to their potted plants. Um, I, I don't think that this is the, the great aspiration of most people. Dr. Eiler, do you have anything to add to that one? Uh, the only thing I would say is that what we might do is we might end up testing how rural and sort of rural to suburban California is able to gain from this. Mm. The idea that if, if you are close enough to a broadband center or you have enough broadband in your suburban or like borderline rural community, you might see people who move out of the cities because they don't want to be in a high density situation. If there's a repeat, their job is portable and they want to go someplace where they will regularly visit. Uh, maybe closer to the mountains or closer to the beach, depending on where that may be. Uh, you might see some small renaissance in that in terms of the low density piece. Uh, we will see. I mean, even those communities are going to struggle with 500 uh, new, you know, 500 people under the age of 40 wearing hoodies and, and riding around on skateboards with their family suddenly coming down and it upsets my ability to walk my dog and go to my favorite coffee shop. There might be some neighborhood rustling if a lot of <laughs> move toward rural California suddenly. But I think there's some opportunity to do something coordinated and strategic here to, to Joel's point in terms of not only utilizing potential mall vacancies, but also thinking about rural and, and borderline suburban California as a place to sort of expand both housing and business. All right. So I'm going to check in with Mission Control and find out um, how much more time we have because we're about at our allotted stop. We're about five more minutes. Okay. So um, let's knock out a couple you know, questions in a speed round here. Uh, <laughs> do we see inflation coming? And if so, what products and services should, would be affected? So, you know, it's funny because you think that after fiscal and monetary policy both come together, basic economics teaches you that that should put pressure on inflation. Well, we had all that come together in 2008, 9, and 10, and we really saw no true inflation pressure that was sustainable. Right now, even bond, bond expectations and inflation expectations over the next 10 years are very, very low, historically speaking. So unless those inflation expectations pick up, you shouldn't really worry about any real true inflation pressure unless there's another event that really chokes off our, our access to goods. Uh, but uh, at the same time, you, you should not run to gold and silver without thinking about your overall portfolio, thinking that this is the end game. And if I don't get into those commodities, I'm smoked. Um, it's, it'll be something, I mean, again, the, there should be a little bit more inflation pressure, but if the last decade taught us anything, even massive policies given our flattened world and the way that we sort of, you know, interact with each other internationally should provide some relief to that. If we become even more parochial and a little bit more nationalistic, it might, might actually pick up prices. And that's a, that's kind of an opportunity cost for PM what an economist would call a more talker. Okay. Joel, did you have anything on that one or uh, I'll, I'll go, I'll go with Dr. Eller on that. All right. So uh, we're going to wrap it up with this question. Um, what risk is there with all the money being poured into the economy as it relates to our deficit? Oh. <laughs> well, I mean, clearly we now have, we do not have a political party that cares about the deficit. Uh, both the Republicans and Democrats are doing the same thing. And of course, in typical boomer fashion, if I can speak as a boomer, um, we're going to leave the bill to our kids. Yeah, I mean, pretty much it's it, we're basically betting on the idea that the world's going to still want to consume our debt and we're OK with that. And that as long as they do, they'll keep bond prices high and bond rates low and it won't really matter to the person on the street. Uh, but if that changes, uh, that's going to be a wild bill to have to pay later. And to Joel's point, you know, our kids are unfortunately going to have to to deal with that uh, with that messenger if, in fact, they come knocking. All right. Well, thank you both very much. Thank Dr. You. Dr. Joel, thank you. really appreciate your time. Um, of course. And thank you all for joining us today. I uh, would like to make, take a moment to thank all the generous OC Forum sponsors for underwriting this event and making the broadcast free of charge for our community, especially the Future of Program Series sponsors, uh, UC Irvine and UC Irvine Health, as well as the Future.
coming weeks as we continue the future of uh, program series with the future of transportation, the future of mental health, and the second installment of the two-part series of the future of the economy. Once again, I'm Todd Harmonson of the Orange County Register. Thank you all for joining us. Please stay safe.